And I'll introduce to you now Shalik, uh, the author of the recording, The Kidnapped African Would Not Die. This is exciting. <laughs> wow. Okay. I heard you, I heard you introduce me and I'm glad of that. Everybody's been welcomed here, and I know you're saying, boy, this is an exciting thing. Kevin, welcome. It's good to see you again. We got so many good friends here. Anyway, the reason that we're here today is really the preview and and we'll call it a mini record, a mini album, and it's called The Kidnapped African Would Not Die. And it has the idea is that there's something inside of us, Africans. Africans who were kidnapped and brought to this country that we gotta bring out. And until we bring it out, we're never really gonna find ourselves and put ourselves in tune. We started on this program about 64 days ago, and I know a lot of you are amazed that I'm a performer now, but this is where I was led. And the reason was that, how many people, have you ever come to a point in your life where you're wondering what to do? I mean, have you ever come to a point where you're not so clear on the plan or course of action you should take? It's okay, you can talk back to me. You ever come to that point? And when you come to that point, a lot of times you have to start seeking and looking at that small voice inside and listening for that small voice to hear what it tells you. Now a lot of times you don't hear the small voice until you get into a little difficulty. You know? When everything's going real good, and you know what I mean, when things are real sweet and fine and going righteous, you don't hear the small voice because you're so busy that you don't have time to give it any attention. But when the time comes and you do hear that small voice, you have to move on it. And that's basically what happened. And when we sat down about 64 days ago, the Spirit led us to start to do something more meaningful than what we were doing before. Not that what we were doing wasn't working, it was working and it was profitable and it was good. It's just at some point in your life you gotta start looking for something a little bit bigger than you are personally looking for an answer, looking for some kind of solution that can help all people of all times. So that's how <coughs> we came into this realization. The records, the recordings that we did as a result of this sort of put us into a spirit where we wanted to share that with you so that you could take that vibration and move on it. The recording that I'd like to share with you now is called Show Me The Way. And the whole idea of show me the way is when you get to that point in your life when you got to find an answer, you got to ask somebody. So let me have our engineer put on show me the way. It's the first time I ever had to compete with one of the machines. <laughs> I don't know, Ali, is it, is, it, is it possible to turn the machine off?
the road to peace of mind, peace of mind. And I'll show you how to shine. All right, thank you. All right, Ali, we get ready for the tape now. Now, stop it right there. That's good. Nobody else. Now, the whole idea was that song is a cry out from inside to get an answer. You know, when, when things aren't going good and you start looking for answers, you need something to show you, something to bring you to a realization of what's happening. Now, as African Americans, the theme of our album is called The Kidnapped African because African Americans, we got a terrible situation that's on us. You know, when you start looking around at what's happening in our lives and in our community, it's terrible. That's why it's good to see brothers like Kevin and his group here because they demonstrate strength that's so often missing from the community. And what is happening right now, the world is talking about a new world order. But if you notice in the news, black folks ain't really in that. We ain't in the new world order at all. Somehow, somebody crossed our name off the list. Thank God this man don't maintain the book of life. So as African Americans, we got to find out where we coming from right now so that we can get back on track. Because if we don't, you see, the next thousand years is going to be a thousand years of peace and joy. And somebody's going to be at the front of the line. It says so in Revelations, that 144,000 that came out of Africa. When we were talking this morning, so many people didn't realize that Egypt was in Africa, that Israel is in Africa. So with this realization, in order for us as African Americans to start putting it together so that we can go forward and don't get crossed off, you see, because something happens. We are given a talent. When I ask God to show me what to do, I opened the Bible. And when I opened it, it opened to the book, one of the parables, the parable of the talents. And I don't know if you know that parable, but basically it says this, that the master went away one day, and he gave one servant five talents, he gave another servant two talents, and he gave one servant one talent. When the master came back, the one who had five talents had worked his and made five more. The master said, good job. You did a, you did a good job in little things, I'm gonna let you handle big things. The, the servant who had two talents, when the master called him to account, he had made two more for a total of four. Master said, good job. When the servant who had only one talent buried that talent, didn't do nothing with it. So when he came to the master, he said, Master, I know you're a hard man, and you gave me this one talent. I didn't want to mess it up, so I buried it, and I'm going to give it back to you just like you gave it to me. The master put foot in his, you know what, cast him out and took that talent and gave it to the one who made five talents. And that's where we're coming from as a people. As African Americans, we have to now look at our talents. Look inside and see what is it that you have to offer to the world. Do you realize that we have given so much to the world already? You can't turn the television on without hearing our music, can you? The athletes, the football, everything is coming out of the spirit that we have, but yet we're suffering, yet we don't have any power, yet we're in a terrible predicament, yet we're at the end of 400 years of serious captivity. So to begin to reconstruct ourselves, you know, when you've been a victim, you have to realize that it ain't your fault. In other words, we've been a victim. 400 years ago, somebody snatched us out of Africa. Every other race in this country came here by choice. The Italians, everybody else came here looking for something. We're the only ones that were born here at the bottom of a ship. Okay? Now, a lot of times, our folks don't want to hear that. Black folks say, well, man, I haven't heard about that. Let's go forward. How many times do you hear about the Holocaust? The Jewish community won't let you forget. They, and they always say, never again. And that was only six million, a hundred million of us perished in the Middle Passage. So we can't let that, that simple-minded thinking deter us. We have to look back at where we came from so that we can see that we are the victim and that now we got to change that victim thinking so that we can go from being a victim to being a victor. Now we have a short video that shows you a little bit about that spirit of where we came from, of what the real deal is about America and the black man. 
And this is being shown simply to put us in perspective and say, now, nah, this is how we got here. These are the conditions under which we started. But now this is where we go forward, knowing that we're in a vicious land under a vicious slave master. We don't walk around like children anymore naive. We know what we're dealing with. Once you know it's a snake, ain't no problem. You don't kiss it. <laughs> you don't pick it up. You don't embrace it. So, Ali, if we could roll the video. We were once a proud people, the custodians of the garden that God planted eastward in Eden. The gatekeepers of the spiritual capital of the world, Jerusalem, Northeast Africa. But we became haughty and disobedient, turning our backs on God and his laws. This story chronicles the fall from grace of African people, the suffering and pain, the final realization of what had to be done to reconcile with God, the return to the promised land, and the establishment of the long-awaited kingdom of God on earth. Because God had known us of all the families of the earth, our chastisement represented one of the most heinous crimes recorded in the annals of human history. We were bought and sold as human cattle, property to be used at the discretion of those who had been given power over us. When Africa awakened, she found herself in the bowels of stench and disease-ridden galleons that carried them across the Atlantic Ocean from the west coast of Africa in that dreaded middle passage to the Americas. One hundred million souls were lost in this Holocaust. Death was all around us. We searched for that elusive freedom, but it wasn't there. We worked in the fields from Camp C in the morning to Camp C at night. We cried out in our suffering, singing the songs of Zion in a strange, strange, strange land, wondering if we had to die and go to heaven to be delivered from all this pain. Our lives meant nothing. We were a strange fruit hanging from the trees of the lands of our captivity. Our blood fertilized its evil. What kind of man was this whose unyielding power we had been delivered? Freedom was very loose. who chose the path toward freedom. Like Matt Turner, who stood up. And Sin Q, who defied the odds. And Harriet Tubman, who led the people out of bondage. Satisfied not only with the white man, but they're dissatisfied with these Negroes who have been sitting around here posing as leaders and spokesmen for black people and actually making the problem worse instead of making the problem better. As we tired of what seemed like a perpetual struggle, we debated civil versus human rights. We saw freedom through sitting in, by marching, through basic resistance. Nonviolence was no longer the answer for some of us. Through organizations like the Black Panther Party, the Republic of New Africa, the Black Liberation Army, we call for direct confrontation with our oppressors, yet our oppression intensified, and we asked through Marvin Gaye, what's going on? We hate oppression. We hate murder of black people in our communities. We hate the growth and unemployment that exists in our communities. Just 
recently returned from Vietnam. Why don't you tell us how it feels to have to come from one zone of combat in a foreign land to one in your own land? It's not a good feeling. Not what I'm kind of proud of. Little self-determination remained unanswered. Was there anyone to assure our freedom? Just as the question was asked biblically, can any good come out of Nazareth? And it was answered with the coming of Jesus. So was that question asked in the ghetto of Chicago. And an answer was born of the frustration, anger, failure, and despair of African people in America. A Messiah came forth. Ben Ami came with a message for his people that if we had tried everything for relief but God, it was time to change masters. The answers we sought were there all along. Ben Ami had a vision based on the prophecy to lead his people out of America back to the promised land to establish an independent community. In August 1967, 400 souls relieved themselves of all their earthly possessions and prepared to leave America for good, returning to the promised land by the way which they had come, first to West Africa and then to Israel. There was much work to be done, clearing the land, preparing the soil, building a new life in the parent land from which we had long been estranged. It was the reunion long sought after and long promised. We chose to establish this new life 110 miles in the bush in Baha. We fought malaria and snakes as we laid the foundation for the true new world order. We had to relive ourselves of the negritudes and ungodly habits we had gained as a result of our 400 year captivity. We were ready in a newfound people for the holy voyage to the promised land. Dr. Martin Luther King, in the twilight of his work, was privileged to share Ben Ami's vision of our return. What happened now? We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And He has allowed me to go up to the mountain.
call for the mass deportation of the entire community. The African Hebrew Israelite community was resilient. We stood fast as campaign after campaign failed. We were denied work permits, access to medical and public educational facilities, proper housing, and we received much bad press in the process. The culmination of the moves against the community occurred on April 22, 1986, when hundreds of special forces stood shoulder to shoulder, three deep, to prevent us from marching to Jerusalem in protest of the incarceration and deportation of the community. We've lived in this land in peace. We have lifted not one finger against any inhabitant of this land. Neither have we conspired against this state. Our children that were born in this land return to this land simply to worship the God of Israel. If there is a conspiracy, man has conspired that we not worship the God of Israel. We did not cause this today. We sent our children out in peace. Provide energies and strength to build this land. We were given hate instead of love. We went in peace and then made war. We stretched out our hands and they attacked us. against them in a physical battle. And we know what they desire to do. We will not give them that opportunity. They didn't come in peace. We will do. We are sons and daughters of peace. But if the trumpet does blow, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. We are concerned. Mm -hmm. And we are troubled. Hey. But let all the inhabitants of the world know we're not afraid. And it's just like that. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Sounds like America, doesn't it? It's just like that. And the reason I want you to, the reason I want you to hear that and to see that is to realize that there are people who have stood up against the adversary and as Ben Ami said, they're not afraid. Now you don't have to go, Ben Ami is in Israel. I spent some time there. But it was important to go there to see what a brother could do working against the adversary and against all odds. Who would think that a black man could go into Israel, one of the most hostile countries in the world, and take him some land? They didn't give him nothing. Okay, they didn't give him not one inch, but he took him some land. And the time we spent there was a time of realization to realize that we have the power to do anything that we want to do if we can get it in our minds. And so that's why this connection is so important.
That is where we started 400 years ago. And as a result of that, we wrote, and in that land, we wrote a piece called The Kidnapped African Would Not Die, which is the title of the album. So if my good brother Ali will hit it, then we will play that piece. When that completes, I want to show you some pictures that we took in Egypt, a part of the King Cut exhibit that's never been seen before, and then we're going to close up and go on home. So now, the kidnapped African would not die.
But we got it together, didn't we? <laughs> Thank you. Now, to close out our program, that is the idea of the kidnapped African. We saw from the beginning of 400 years ago. And to close out, I want us to see something. When I was in Egypt, I wanted to see where we really came from. You know, because when we start talking about history, this whole country is only about three or 400 years old. And when you talk about King Tut, and everybody talks about King Tut because the, the significance of King Tut was that was the only tomb that was never opened and vandalized. So when they opened it, they found it just like it had been left 3,500 years ago. When I went to Egypt to see our roots, I saw that 3,500 years ago, black men, and ain't no doubt about it, you know, you can look at all that stuff in the Cecil B. DeMille, but these are black men. And what I'm going to show you is over 3,000 pieces in the Cairo Museum of the King Tut exhibit. They only let 49 pieces travel around the country. And those are the ones with the golden head, because you can't tell he's a brother. But in this video, you're going to see things like his bed, his head, his thrones, his scepters, where you can see that he ruled the Chinese and the Africans. In other words, that Egypt ruled the world. And King Tut was a minor king. In other words, he never even served as pharaoh. He was killed at 18 years old, and you see what he had in his tomb. Can you imagine what the tomb of Ramesses who ruled for 63 years must have had in his tomb. When I saw Ramesses' statue, they had a statue of him as long as this entire bar. With detail, you can see his nail all carved out of solid granite. The question to me was, how did they move it? <laughs> okay, weighed over 95 tons. This is the distant glory that we have been stolen in the night. We need to focus on that to realize how great and powerful we really are. So Ali, if we could show a little bit of Egypt. I'll sort of walk us through it as it goes. Okay, we ready. This is Cairo, Egypt. These are the Great Pyramids. These pyramids are, have approximately two and one half million stones. The average weight is 5,000 pounds. 20 years ago, there were over 83 pyramids in Egypt. There are only about three left now. The Egyptians, who are not the Egyptians of old, destroyed them and to remove the stones to build mosques and housing. You can also see the Sphinx. This is right outside of Cairo. This now is the Cairo Museum. And you've seen, have most of you seen some of these figures before? And you look at, you look at those lips. Now you say, what is this? This is a brother. Would you agree? This now is the inside of the Cairo Museum. This is our guide. And the funny thing that happened was that when I went to check my camera, for some reason they thought I was an Egyptian. So instead of taking the camera, they gave me a pass to let me film this museum. I don't know to date if there's anybody else that's ever filmed some of the things that you see in this museum. This lady is our guide. She is now married to Dr. Ben. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Ben Yohanan, the great Egyptologist. Well, I was there with him on this tour. This is the ground floor of the Cairo Museum. And you know, you can see, look at the pieces. All of these are marble pieces. These were tombs of pharaohs. <coughs> they have over 30 pharaohs' bodies right now preserved in the Cairo Museum. There was a family that once the grave robbers started to take apart the great tombs in Israel, in Egypt, this family took all the bodies of the pharaohs and for 2,000 years had them hidden in a cave. In 1857, an Englishman tricked them and found them. So all the, the pharaohs, Ramesses, Seti, their bodies are right in this building. Now what we're doing, looking at now is the beginning of the King Tut exhibit. The first piece I want you to focus on is King Tut's self-portrait. It's a statue that was made completely in his likeness. As soon as he finishes talking, we'll get to it. This 
is King Tut, a picture of King Tut's statue. And the action statue is standing right down the hall. There it is. You can see the back of it. Now, in his tomb, all of these pieces were found in his tomb. Our guide is just sharing some stuff with us about the fact that over 3,000 pieces were found in the tomb and that these, this was the only tomb that was not touched by, it was not robbed by people. Look at this brother. Doesn't he look like somebody down on 55th Street? All of that is gold. Now you must remember that this was done approximately 3,500 years ago. You can look at his face. Look at the features. All of that is gold. There was made generally of black mahogany with ivory and gold. Gold was extremely plentiful in Egypt. I think I just saw that, brother, just last week. Look at his feet. I mean, the likeness there is incredible. You can even see his navel. It's funny, when we were filming this, I don't think that film ever worked, that camera ever worked this good since or before. These are some of his shields. You can see that these were not primitive people. They would like for us to believe that Africans were primitive and try to take Egypt out of Africa. But Egypt is right there in the heart of Africa. These are all pieces that were taken out of the tomb, such as King Tut's shield. This is his chest set. Now this doesn't look like a primitive people, does it? This is made of black mahogany and ivory. Looks like something you can see in the store right downtown, 3,500 years ago. These are really the thing, and you must remember, he was a child king. He was only 18 when he was killed. He was killed by the priests because it, at 18 he was to take over the kingdom. They had run the kingdom from the time he was 10 when his father died until the time he was 18. They decided they didn't want to give it up and they killed him. This is one of the ceremonial dogs. All of these figures now are gold. This is all gold, mahogany, and ivory. You'll see numerous of those statues inside the tomb. This is one of his uh, treasure chests. This is all ivory and mahogany. You see where they get a lot of designs from, <laughs> you know, when you see jewelry and whatnot. That is one of the ceremonial dogs, once again, on gold. These are other of his boxes. You can see that they were great artists, the amount of detail that they were able to do. Look at this. This is all in ivory made with little beads. And this is King Tut and his wife. I and mean, the detail is incredible. It's so amazing that this stuff looks like it was made last week, doesn't it? Looks like it was something that people just created. This is another one of his game pieces. The final piece I want to show you, there's so much more on we could be here about all night. Is everybody enjoying this video? Yes. Give some realization. Maybe I should have a little of it, because every now and then the lady says something real important and my voice may get a little monotonous. You can see the sign of the ark, the sign of eternal life.
Inside the tomb, you'll find all of these little figures. And the reason for these figures was that the Egyptians believed that their spirit could dwell in different places. So they would put many copies of figures, all basically replicas of either King Tut or of one of his parents or, or his uh, brothers and sisters. The purpose of these was that his spirit could reside in any of these places until the time came that he would be reawakened. Gold was so plentiful in that country. I mean, it, it's amazing to just see silver was actually more valuable than gold. The amazing thing in the museum, they just saw the stuff, stuff around, just sit it here, sit it there. These are more of the dolls that were inside, and I don't, they're really likenesses, they're not dolls, they're likenesses. But they were lined up along the wall of the tomb so that his spirit could dwell therein. These are all art pieces. The group that we were with was about 50 African Americans who had gone down there for Christmas. We spent about three weeks uh, in Egypt, traveling from the south down as far as the Sudan up back to the Mediterranean. These are King Tut's parents, by the way. Well, Cecil B. DeMille must have never seen this when he was making his King Tut pictures and Moses. You can see that the hair is clearly braided. When you look at it like that, you can see that it was coarse hair. A lot of times when they do Egyptian pictures, they make it think that that's a hat. But that's braids just like the sisters get right now. It's funny when you're in the museum and you watch people who are not African people come through and look at that. They don't they ain't happy about it. You know, you don't see a feeling of, of awe. Like we see that feeling of like, man, that's me, that's my people. But they come through and they look real mean. The final piece I want to share with you here is that the fact that King Tut ruled the world and to show you that at that time, 3,500 years ago, he was ruling the Chinese people, he was ruling the African people. This is a uh, box with his different scepters. And at the head of certain scepters, you can see the likeness of the people that he ruled. In the right-hand corner, it'll be coming up in a minute, you'll be able to see the figure of the Chinese person. A Caucasian looking person too that he ruled right see there in the corner there Did everybody see that in the right corner I was trying to that if you can see it's a Chinese figure the one next to it is somewhat of an American Indian looking figure there's a clearly African figure but there were seven scepters there showing the different peoples that he ruled you see it there in the right hand the white one? Yes? Okay. This is the Nigerian. There, I was trying. See, I was shooting through a glass, so it's very difficult to focus. Okay. Ali? Yeah. Okay, we can. We could go on and on with this, and maybe one day when we get an earlier start, we could go through some other pieces, sharing what this is all about and sharing more of the Egyptian heritage. But any questions about it before we close out? Yes? When you see those head pieces with the 
places of animals like the dogs, what did those represent? What, what were they? Well, most of them represented gods. Like the Egyptians had the falcon god, the dog god, the zebra god. Uh, a lot of times you see the lions. The lion represented one of the types of gods. But generally they represented, they sort of believed that the gods dwell within different animals. One of the reasons that King Tut's father was a very different kind of person, he was the first one to introduce what they say one god. Because the Egyptians had the sun god, the moon god, the this god. And he was the first to introduce one God. And he believed in it so strongly that he gave up the throne. And that was how the throne literally became vacant for King Tut. Even King Tut was a child when he gave up the throne. And he put the throne in the hands of caretakers to show how much he believed in the fact that peace could, be, could work. The, to me, that set up the conquest of the people by the Greeks when Alexander the Great came through around 300 BC. Was his father Yes, that's right. And that there's so little when you and when you travel through the tomb, they have a listing of every pharaoh, and there were two that they crossed out. In other words, they have the cartouche, which is the name of the pharaoh, and one was Amenhotep because he changed the religion of the Egyptians, and the other was uh, Hatshepsut, and that was because she was a woman pretending to be a man for 18 years. And when you go through the land, she took the throne of her nephew and ran Egypt for 18 years pretending to be a man with a beard. And when her nephew came into his own, he proceeded to kill her and went throughout the country. You go through all of Egypt and all the statues of Hatshepsut, the face has been chipped away because he never wanted anyone to see that. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we're going to close out. Ali, you can just put the tape on, let the tape, uh, the audio tape, you can let this keep running and just put the audio tape on real soft as we just sort of close out. I want to thank everybody. Did I? First, let me just tell you this, that two ladies have really, that's exciting, two ladies have really helped put this thing together. Without this, without them, this could not have happened. There's lots of food to bully all kinds of healthy things in the back, because that's a part of this new, uh, generation. So I'd like for Estella and Valerie, let's stand, let's give you a big hand for making this all happen. <laughs> also, my friend Lester, the cameraman, Lester and I go back about 150 years, two or three lifetimes. But Lester always documents everything. I know it's been a real difficult shoot for him today because we weren't sure how it was going to work out. But uh, yes, sir. Um. <clears throat> I'd like to mention that something you said I thought was so important that it really motivated me when you said, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear you talk about uh, the slavery trade and, and the middle passages and all that. They try to say you should forget about that. But you know, like what I try to do is I try to, wherever I go, I try to preach that. Because yes. you know, that's what motivated me. We should never forget that. Yes. You know, because that's part of our history. Right. And you know, you gotta, you gotta realize that in order for people to survive that, you had to be strong. Yes. And that's what I try to tell some of the young brothers and sisters out here now. That you are strong, you just gotta look within yourself that's and right. see that. That's right. That's right. You know, that's what you know, from what I saw, it was real motivating to me. Beautiful. You know, I said I almost cried yeah. when I seen the brothers in the in the in the chains and the shackles, you know. We come a long way. We have come a long way. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Let's give this brother. go into the slave castle and you walk down the hall in West Africa, you feel real bad. I mean, because you can almost feel it and you can still smell it. I mean, after hundreds of years, there's a smell in there that you know it was a smell of suffering and pain and fear. But we, 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 we now are growing that. We, we're growing beyond that. But knowing where we came from and knowing the power that we have to be resilient be able to overcome. I mean, the, the fact that we're still around after 400 years <laughs> is real tough. But that's the way it's got to be because God wants it that way. we got a lot of work to do and we got to get started on it. Anyway, close up shop. We have the tapes here. And what we really wanted to do was we'd like for you to get some of these tapes. What we were, we were looking forward to folks doing was this. To get the tapes and the poster, there's an audio tape. the post.
poster, and the poster has the kidnapped African on it. It's an excellent poster to frame and put up, which is the lyrics to the song that me and the machine kind of did together. Also, another poster called 12 Affirmations to Live By. You start getting yourself charged up and pumped up. All the music that you're hearing here today is a part of the music on the kidnapped African. Then we can pass these around and take a look at those music here. So, we have them right here over in the corner. I'd recommend everybody leave here tonight with one or some or some tapes. Take it, share the message with other people. And we're going to be doing some beautiful stuff after the new year. Did I forget anything? Did I forget anybody? All right. Well, let's everybody give yourselves a big hand. And thanks for coming out.